Yes, well, the Federal Council on the Arts and Humanities is the uh, organization that's above, sort of at the top. Then below it is the National Council for the Arts and the National Council for the Humanities. And then under both of them is the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And the Federal Council uh, has never really had a role to play before, and so it's been uh, moribund. But now, President Carter has asked the Federal Council to study for, I suppose, about a year what the effect the federal government has on the arts, what, in pro what programs the federal government has beyond the two endowments, um, what federal policies affect the arts and humanities, whether they're, it's a good effect or a bad effect, just exactly what it is. Nobody's ever sat down to study it. And I find that there's a tremendous need for this kind of statement because in many areas the federal government encourages the arts and in other areas it really is very discouraging. This will take quite a long while and I'm not sure exactly now how we're going to do it. I'm sure we'll have hearings and so forth. But the members of the federal council are, uh, come from the departments that affect the arts. Um, commerce, uh, the interior, the Smithsonian, the two endowments, and so forth, plus uh, a congressman here and there. <laughs> yes, I really think so. Um, a great deal depends upon the sensitivities of the cabinet officer who w runs the program. And I have a very good example of a, of a wonderful man, Cecil Andrus, who's the Secretary of the Interior. And at the very beginning of the administration, I spoke to him about the possibility of selling crafts in national parks that were made by people in the region. And he said, that's a wonderful idea. And now he hired a consultant, and the consultant has gone around and chosen a nine or ten national parks in areas where there are many craftspeople. And this summer, the American people are going to be able to buy mugs and glassware, weaving, uh, broomsticks, uh, candles, and so on, made by the local craftspeople. And it's, it was just a yes, a simple yes from the cabinet officer. And all of those men whom I've dealt with have been very receptive and very open. I've had uh, Pat Harris, for example, to lunch at our house to talk about using HUD funds for artists' housing and so forth, and rent supplements uh, to help them among other things. And I've also had Secretary Marshall, Secretary of Labor, to talk about the CETA program and what incredible potentials the CETA program has for in paying artists' salaries and encouraging people who are trained in the arts to give them a little job experience so that they can make a living uh, on their own. There's an incredible interest in this country in hand work. Uh, people are not only knitting, but doing needlepoint, and there are a great many weavers who are taking classes and developing. Um, I, I think that people realize the satisfaction of making something like that with their hands. And there's a lot of folk art, there's a lot of art programs for the elderly, and uh, I really think that it's quite acceptable. You know, for a long time the crafts were really looked down upon by the serious uh, artistic critics and by the museums. I think now that there's such vitality and there's such diverseness and such richness and so many people are going into the crafts for a full-time livelihood that uh, the art critics and the museums are taking them more seriously. It's very difficult and very sad for me to classify any group of people. But if I had to do it, I would say that the craftspeople in this country are part of the working poor. They work very, very hard. They have incredibly high standards and long hours for these beautiful little objects that even I cannot appreciate how much work went into them. I met a potter, a woman who has two children in Deer Isle in Maine, and I asked her point blank, what is your income? She said, I work eight hours a day, five days a week. My entire income is $4,000, of which 2000 pay for my expenses. So she lived with two children on $2,000 a year. I couldn't do it.
she do, she wants to work. She's uh, she's happy. She could she taught at Boston University. She could go back and teach, but she didn't want to do it. She wanted to make pots. And what I hope can happen in this country is an increased appetite on the part of the Americans for something that's handmade because it is unique. It is genuine. It, you might buy a set of six cups, coffee mugs, and they might be similar, but they're not identical. And there's something very special that a craftsperson can give to you as a gift of uh, their own creativity and their own talent. Uh, well, um, I suppose I've always been interested in the arts. I, uh, when I was in high school, I took a jewelry class on Saturday mornings in the basement of a neighbor's house, and I always liked to make things. And in college, I realized I wasn't going to be a great visual artist. <laughs> but I think there's something very personal about working with clay. Um, it's uh, a very tangible and concrete and I think relatively easily conquered medium. It's not impossible to center clay. You can. Uh, sometimes it takes a little longer than other things to do, but it's not that complex. Um, there, there's a whole tradition of functionalism with it, because what you make, you use, mostly. And I found that it's a, a very relaxing medium, because I can forget about all the other things in my life, because I really have to concentrate so completely on the clay itself, centering it first and bringing up the sides and so on, and then trimming and glazing, that it is, uh, it's a release from all kinds of uh, other intangibles. You know, speaking, being interviewed, meeting people, it's very intangible. It's very exciting and very thrilling. But when you work with pottery, there's the object that you made, and you really put a great deal of yourself into it. Also, it's not only a disciplined medium, as all the arts are, um, it also says something about yourself, because if it goes wrong, you have no one else to blame except yourself. You are totally responsible. But it gives you a, a wonderful feeling of being able to make something, to give as a friend, sharing part of yourself.